I love the locust tree, the sweet white locust. How much, how much, how much does it cost to love the locust tree in bloom? A fortune bigger than Avery could muster. So much, so much. The shelving green locust, whose bright small leaves in June lean among the flowers, sweet and white, at heavy cost. A cool of books will sometimes lead the mind to libraries of a hot afternoon, if books can be found cool to the sense, to lead the mind away. For there is a wind or ghost of a wind in all books, echoing the life there, a high wind that fills the tubes of the ear until we think we hear a wind actual to lead the mind away. Drawn from the streets, we break off our mind's seclusion and are taken up by the book's winds, seeking, seeking, downwind, until we are unaware which is the wind and which the winds power over us to lead the mind away. And it grows in the mind a scent, it may be, of locust blossoms, whose perfume itself is a wind moving to lead the mind away through which, below the cataract, soon to be dry, the river whirls and eddies. First recollected, spent from wandering the useless streets these months, faces folded against him like clover at nightfall. Something has brought him back to his own mind, in which a falls unseen tumbles and writes itself and refalls and does not cease falling and refalling with a roar, a reverberation, not of the falls, but of its rumor unabated. Beautiful thing, my dove, unable, and all who are wind-blown, touched by the fire, and unable. A roar that soundless drowns the sense with its reiteration, unwilling to lie in its bed and sleep and sleep, sleep in its dark bed. In the recently published The H.D. Book, a collection that until now only existed in separate chapters in out-of-print little magazines, Robert Duncan writes, quote, the secret of the poetic art lies in the keeping of time. To keep time, designing or discovering lines of melodic coherence, counting the measures, marking them off, the whole intensified in the poet's sense of its limitation. One image may recall another, finding death in the re-sounding. He wrote this in 1961. The boycott is even more severe in 2011. But I believe this currently exiled spirit, Keats' beauty is truth, truth, beauty, Walter Benjamin's, the beautiful is neither the veil nor the veiled object, but rather the object in its veil. William Carlos Williams, beautiful thing of flame, and beauty is a defiance of authority. I believe this spirit, a deposit from a future yet to come, is gathered and guarded in the domain of research libraries and special collections. On June 20th, 1926, Hart Crane, then staying on his mother's family property on the Isle of Pines, Cuba, wrote to Waldo Frank while working on what he hoped would be his epic poem, The Bridge. Quote, the form of my poem rises out of the past that so overwhelms the present with its worth and vision that I'm at a loss to explain my delusion that there exists any real links between that past and a future destiny worthy of it. The destiny is long since completed. Perhaps the little last section of my poem is a hangover echo of it, but it hangs suspended somewhere in ether, like an Absalom by his hair. Endure that line. 
Possibly during 1885, the year before she died, Emily Dickinson wrote in a letter to her sister-in-law, Susan, emerging from an abyss and re-entering it. That is life, is it not, dear? The tie between us is very fine, but a hair never dissolves. Things in themselves and things as they are for us. Often by chance, by out-of-the-way card catalogs or through previous web surfing, a particular deep text or a simple object, a bobbin, a sampler, a scrap of lace, reveals itself here at the surface of the visible by mystic documentary telepathy, quickly, precariously, coming as it does from an opposite direction. If you are lucky, you may experience a moment before. In 1875, Dickinson jotted on a fragment of stationery, luck is not chance, it's toil. Fortune's expensive smile is earned. The father of the mind is that old-fashioned coin we spurned. The English definition for text and textile is taken from the Latin textus, from textere to weave, meaning that which is woven. In Sentences, 1928, Gertrude Stein writes, what is a sentence? A sentence is an imagined front piece. In looking up from her embroidery, she looks up at me. It is partly. A sentence furnishes while they will draw. What is the difference between a sentence and a sum? What is the difference between a sentence and a picture? An article by Edward Moore and Arthur Burks on editing the manuscripts of the philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce has an epigraph taken from the horse's mouth. I am a mere table of contents, a very snarl of twine. In research libraries and collections, we may capture the portrait of history in so-called insignificant visual and verbal textualities and textiles, in material details, in twill fabrics, beadwork pieces, pricked patterns, tiny spangles, sharp-toothed stencil wheels, in quotations, thought fragments, inscriptions, endangered phonemes, even soils and stains. One historical existential trace has been hunted, captured, and preserved in aversion to waste by an avid collector, then put carefully away outside of an economy of use inaccessible to touch. Now it is reanimated, recollected, recollected, through an encounter with the mind of a curious reader, a researcher, an antiquarian, a sub-sub-librarian, a bibliomaniac, a poet. Each collected object or manuscript is a pre-articulate empty theater where a thought may surprise itself at the instant of seeing, where a thought may hear itself see. I held it so tight that I lost it, said the child boy of the butterfly. Of many a vaster capture, that is the elegy. For conversion, there must be a, there must be a mysterious leap of love. Sometimes a hidden verso side acts as prior counterpoint the way improvised children's tales have needlepoint roots in Latin holy words and medieval jargon. What difference does it make if what we see before our mind's eye has already been interpreted? This meanly magnificent waste is on a scale beyond actual use. 
It provides us with a sense of life hereafter. Coming home to poetry, you permit yourself liberties. In the first place, happiness. On August 19, 1926, Hart Crane ended a letter to Waldo Frank this way. I have never been able to leave, live completely in my work before. Now it is to learn a great deal, to handle the beautiful skeins of this myth of America, to realize suddenly, as I seem to, how much of the past is living under only slightly altered forms, even in machinery and such like, is extremely exciting. So I'm having the time of my life just now, anyway. In 1828, the first edition of Noah Webster's An American Dictionary of the English Language defines skein this way. Skein, a knot or number of knots of thread, silk, or yarn, a loosely coiled length of yarn or thread wound in a reel suitable for a manufacturing process as dyeing or for sale as knitting wool or embroidery something suggesting the twistings and contradictions of a skein unravel the tangled skein of evidence. A trimmed strip of osier made from splits for basket work. A metal thimble on an axle tree arm. A flock of wildfowl in flight. That's why reading um, Noah Webster's original dictionary is very often like reading poetry. It's completely changed now. Anyway, um, Noah Webster's The American Dictionary of the English Language is repeatedly invoked through our 19th century interpreters, Emerson, Melville, Hawthorne, Dickinson, Whitman, and many others. Edward Dickinson's copy of the first edition was in the family library, and Emily Dickinson herself owned an 1844 reprint of the 1841 edition. Noah Webster, with her grandfather, Samuel Fowler Dickinson, was one of the founders of Amherst College. And her father was on the board of the excellent Amherst Academy she attended as a girl, and where for a time, Webster served as president of the board. In 1862, she told Thomas Wentworth Dickinson, when a little girl, I had a friend who taught me immortality, but venturing too near himself, he never returned. Soon after, my tutor died, and for several years, my lexicon was my only companion. Dictionary definitions could, could be called skeins, singularities, spirit sparks. Noah Webster, stitch, verb transitive, one, to sew with the back puncture of the needle so as to double the thread, to sew or unite together as to stitch the leaves of a book or form a pamphlet. Two, to form land into riches, New England. Running over affinities and relations, as was her practice, Dickinson could discover on the previous STI page of her lexicon the definition for S-T-I-C-H pronounced stick, one, in poetry, a verse of whatever measure or number of feet. Two, in rural affairs, an order or rank of trees. In New England, as much land as lies between double furrows is called stick or a land. Or she could skip down a few words on the same page to stick a mancy. The divination of lines or passages of books taken at hazard. Quotations are lines or passages seized at hazard from piled up cultural treasures. A citation exerts a finite, particular inflection in advance. Cut or teased out with a needle, it can interrupt the continuous flow of a poem, a sampler, an essay, or a lecture like this one. After Dickinson's death, this note was found among her papers. What a hazard an accent is. When I think of the hearts it has scuttled or sunk, I almost fear to lift my hand to as much as a punctuation. Now, this is my news. The search is a poet for his language. 
to greet with the language of the noise of the falls, which seems in itself to be a language which we were and still are seeking. Between 1946 and 1958, William Carlos Williams labored over the work he conceived of as a long poem in four parts. He eventually com completed five, and at the end of his life, had started on the sixth. The, the five were first published by New Directions in separate limited editions, my favorite, book three, The Library, in 1949. He later said that in Patterson, he wanted to, quote, use the multiple facets which a city presented as representatives for comparable facets of contemporary thought, thus to be able to objectify the man himself as we know him and love him and hate him. I deliberately selected Patterson as my reality, unquote. Once he had fixed on the city, he needed to gather and collect facts, particularly in relation to the place and from libraries, and um, local and otherwise, especially to the Passaic River and its falls. For many years, I taught and lived in Buffalo, another hard up northeastern or easternmost midwestern Rust Belt city with the larger, more dramatic falls. But it wasn't until this September, when I returned to give a reading and because I was working on this lecture, that I actually visited the original documents that went into forming Book 3, now housed in the library up there at SUNY. Here I encountered the actual preliminary jottings, typed and retyped drafts, and collected newspaper clippings he used as fuel for fire. This is out of Patterson 3. Whirling flames, leaping from house to house, building to building, carried by the wind. The library is in their path. Beautiful thing, a flame. A defiance of authority burnt Sappho's poems, burned by intention, or are they still hid in the Vatican crypts? Beauty is a defiance of authority, for they were unwrapped fragment by fragment from outer mummy cases of papier mache inside Egyptian sarcophagi. Niagara Falls and the Great Falls of the Passaic River. Names are supposed to be signs for things, but what if things are actually the signs of names? What if words possess a spirit potential to their nature as words? Then, like things of experience, in their passage between languages, materialize into posthumous vowel notes whipped up with shifting consonantal impact until, by a sidestep or little jump, the embroidered manifestation of an earlier vernacular reflects authority, Edenic justice, through ciphered wilderness and pen. Poet, are you there? Prescription, prefatory writing, order, rule, the establishment of a claim of title to something under common law by virtue of immemorial use, a written direction for the preparation, compounding, and administration of medicine, name, age, address, date, telephone. When we were children playing games of hide and seek, the person chosen to be it, now turned round alone and counting, was supposed to keep on looking in spite of snares and false resemblances. Ask the librarian behind the desk for a cardboard box of, la of labeled file folders containing little whispering skeletons. Place one in my looking glass hands. As such, as such, the sweet white locust tree, at heavy cost. This consecrated branch transmits to posterity the benefits of seeds or buds hidden in trees for thousands of years. 
1835. This is from Nathaniel Hawthorne's short story, um, Young Goodman Brown, and I couldn't believe that how it spoke to this uh, Jonathan Edwards cover for one of his books. Nathaniel Hawthorne, faith, shouted Goodman Brown in a voice of agony and desperation. And the voices of the forest mocked him, crying, faith, faith as if bewildered wretches were seeking her all through the wilderness. Previous work I've done in terms of manuscripts and archives led me to the massive collection of the papers of the 18th century New England theologian, some say our first American philosopher, Jonathan Edwards, in New Haven at Yale's Beinecke Library. The Beinecke Rare uh, Book Room uh, is uh, the, the library itself is um, one of the largest buildings in the world, devoted entirely to rare books and manuscripts. It was constructed from Vermont marble and granite, bronze, and glass during the early 1960s. The structure displays and contains acquisitive violence, the rapacious fetching involved in collecting. On the other hand, it radiates a sense of peace. Downstairs in the modernist reading room, I hear the purr of the air filtration system, the rippling sound of pages turning, singular out-of-tune melodies of computers redoing. Scholars are seated at wide work tables bent in devotion over some particular material object. They could be copying out a manuscript or deciphering a pattern. Here is deep memory's lure and sheltering. In this room, I experience enduring relations and connections between what was and what is. Meineke's vast collection of Edwards family memorabilia contains letters, diaries, notebooks, essays, and more than 1,200 sermons, most of them in minuscule script. Jonathan Edwards was the only son among 10 unusually tall sisters their minister father jokingly referred to as his 60 feet of daughters. <laughs> their mother, Esther Stoddard Edwards, also known for her height, taught her 11 children and others in Northampton in a school that consisted of a downstairs room in their farmhouse. Later, they received the same education Timothy provided to local boys in his parish in East Windsor, Connecticut. The girls were tutored along with their brother. In some cases, they tutored him in theology, philosophy, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, history, grammar, and mathematics. All except Mary were sent to finishing school in Boston. But almost all that remains from this 18th century family's impressive tradition of female learning are a bed sheet probably woven by his mother, a tiny blue fragment of his wife Sarah Pierpont Edwards' wedding dress, a journal kept by Esther Edwards Burr, Jonathan Sarah's oldest and Sarah's oldest daughter, and several raggedy scraps from his younger sister Hannah's private writings. That's one of them. The folio-sized double leaves Jonathan Sarah and his ten tall sisters wrote on were often handmade, hand-stitched from linen rags, salvaged from worn-out clothing, lists, sermons quotations of psalms, dissonant scripture clusters, are pressed between coarse cardboard covers with frayed edges. The rag paper color has grown deeper and richer in some. Three of Edwards' manuscript books I particularly love are titled Efficacious Grace. Two of them he constructed from discarded semicircular pieces of silk paper his wife and daughters used for making fans. If you open these small oval volumes and just look without trying to decipher the minister's spidery script, pen strokes begin to resemble textile thread text. Surface and meaning cooperate to keep alive in one process, mastering service service in mastery. I've always been drawn to Edwards, even at his angriest, such as the famous sinners in the hands of an angry God when he was really angry, uh, which has a wonderful 
epigraph from Deuteronomy, their foot shall slide in due time. <laughs> um, for some, I must be sick, but anyway. Um, I find that he's very comforting. <laughs> um, um, because he understands the way in which single words and sense clusters directly affect involuntary memory. Involuntary memory is lucid, pre-verbal, soothing, hit or miss an arrow into the eye of loving. One day by chance, I opened a folder titled Wetmore Hannah Edwards Diary in the hand of her daughter, Lucy Wetmore Whittlesey. Inside was a copy of the private writings of Jonathan's sister. Lucy's late 18th century italic script, much easier to read than her uncle and her mother's early handwriting, begins in media race with an excerpt from <coughs> Psalm 55, 6. Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. The visual and acoustic shock of that first explanatory O oh on paper brown with age made me think in a rush of Henry James' great novel, The Wings of the Dove, and of the beauty of the King James Version of the 55th Psalm in relation to its wide use in this novel, where James so perfectly finds his form for work that is to follow. The fictional orphaned American heiress Millie Peel, quote, stricken and doomed, condemned to die under short respite, while also enamored of the world, unquote, is based on James' American cousin, Minnie Temple, whose early death he feeds on as an artist. James brings Minnie to life in Wings, and again in 1914, at the end of his long writing career, with a moving tribute to his, this beloved cousin as he brings notes of the son and brother, his rambling memories of William and himself, to its last two paragraphs. This is the passage from it. Death, at the last, was dreadful to her. She would have given anything to live. And the image of this, which was to remain long with me, appeared so of the essence of tragedy that I was in the far off after time to seek to lay the ghost by wrapping it, a particular occasion aiding, in the beauty and dignity of art. And I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. Lo, would I wander far off and remain in the wilderness, seal. Had the wings of a dove, though. But whether could I fly, oh, and abiding portion, and no ring, deceiving in joints, where shall I find real? I wander from mountain, Oh, that I could rest for the soul and weary myself. Language leads to the limit of breath. The grapheme age, breath's last letter remnant, hangs suspended somewhere in ether, like an asthma, by his hair. And this, I'm reading now again from Williams. Read, and that's a Dickinson fragment. Read, bring the mind back, attendant upon the page, to the day's heat. The page also is the same beauty, a dry beauty of the page, beaten by whips, a tapestry hound with his thread teeth drawn crimson from the throat of the unicorn, a yelping of white hounds under a ceiling like that of San Lorenzo the long painted beams straight across that preceded the domes and arches, more primitive, square-edged. A docile queen, not bothered to stick her tongue out at the moon, indifferent through loss, but queenly in bad luck, <coughs> the luck of the stars, the black stars, the night of a mine. Dear heart, it's all for you my dove, my changeling.
The wing of poetry is also the rushing wing of measure, infinite upon infinite, contemplative immersion, split second luck. The first lines of the preface to all of Patterson are, rigor of beauty is the quest, but how will you find beauty when it is locked in the mind past all remonstrance? To make a start out of particulars. Rather than being able to write anything concrete about Edwards and his manuscripts, I drew from the experience of viewing their chance conjunctions, attached flaps, cut-ups, mixed messages, erasures, delineations, affiliations, and started to produce something made from Hannah's private writings with a mix of other sources. Walking just below my father's orchard after I Walking just below my father's orchard after I religion and the concerns of my soul, my business, religion and the concerns of my soul, my business, strayed for him and labored after an awakening sense of In research libraries and special collections, words and objects come into their own and have their place again. This known world, this exact moment, a little after. Not quite. I remember the summer before my sister Jerusha's death making him. And I was leaning over the south fence and thinking in this manner that I was never likely to do better. And where should I go, etc. Most of my writing life has been spent in Connecticut, not far from where Hannah Edwards Wetmore lived and wrote. Reading her private writings, I experienced through an occult invocation of verbal links and forces, the qualities peculiar to our seasonal changing light and color. It's a second kind of knowledge, tender, tangled, violent, august, and infinitely various. Oh, the Romans to on the other hand. World, I used to be there. That soft, or in a soul, really no more what I was, and thereby the music was, and therefore lost mm. I was. Consulted with myself about it, and it was ready. Her name begins and ends with the aspirate phoneme H, spectral letter H, occult. Quick thought reached through the fire of reading. To touch is to reach. Poetry has no proof, nor plan, nor evidence, by decree, or in any other way. From somewhere in the twilight realm of sound, a spirit of belief flares up at the point where meaning stops and the unreality of what seems most real floods over us. The inward ardor I feel while working in research libraries is intuitive. It's a sense of self it's a sense of self-identification and trust, or the granting of grace in an ordinary room in a secular time. Thank you.